on today's Run to the Top podcast. You, you can't just say that if you've had a bad night's sleep, you're going to perform badly. In fact, a lot of athletes that I work with who are probably the poorest sleepers, and they're actually the best performers. And the reason for that is it's this theory of hyper arousal. So we've all had the experience of you can't shut your head off because you're just thinking of stuff over and over again. This, this happens more often than not in these like wired people. So the stuff that I'm trying to do is make sleep education and sleep management more specific to the individual who are basically wired. So those are people that get their sleep disturbances the most. What can we do to help them basically de-arouse themselves before bed? Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast from Runners Connect, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. Together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thanks so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by Runners Connect. Last week, we heard from the one and only Jay DeSherry, who gave us fantastic advice about how we can work on our imbalances and put our bodies in a place where we feel healthy and strong, rather than a ticking time bomb, which I know I definitely used to feel that way, and I feel so much better now I don't have to worry about that. I don't know if that makes any sense to you guys, but if you are feeling like you're always on the verge of injury, make sure you go back and check that one out. Today, I thought it was about time we went back to approach the topic of sleep. Now, we did have Dr. James Mars on last year, and I'll put a link to that episode in the show notes. James is one of the world-renowned experts on the topic, but today we're coming at it from a little bit of a different angle. Luke Gupta is our guest today, and he might not have all the products and a pillow named after him in Bed Bath & Beyond, which, by the way, I did buy that pillow, and I quite like it. But he is the one right at the centre of all the research. He is specifically focusing on sleep and performance. And let's just say I was surprised with what he shared with me during this interview. You're going to love this one. And Luke gives lots of actionable tips to actually help us shut our brains off at night. Or am I the only one that struggles with that? I am hoping and guessing I'm probably not the only one. But either way, you're going to get some great advice from him. All right, that's enough from me. Let's meet Luke. I want to say a big thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this podcast and for helping me with my training over the last few years. You can enter to win a pack of six perfect amino bottles for free by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. Thank you to Sockany for supporting the Run to the Top podcast. Running might be a low maintenance sport, but a good pair of running shoes is a must. Use coupon code TINA for 10% off at Sockany.com when you pick out your next pair. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. This is something that's really interesting and uh, something I definitely have taken a lot of interest in. And I love that we finally have someone who we can kind of pick their brain about this. And I love that you're English as well, of course. But first, uh, just for anyone listening, you're a uh, physiology PhD student and a sports science technician. You specialize in sleep and athletic performance at the English Institute of Sport, which I'm quite excited to hear more about. But that must be kind of a highly sought after position trying to get that kind of level. So firstly, I'd love to kind of hear how you got into it and how you got this position here right now. Yes, yeah, so I suppose I started off at university studying sports science mm-hmm. and quite a broad uh, topic, as you can imagine. It obviously covers lots of disciplines such as psychology, physiology, strength and conditioning, nutrition. So I kind of started there, studied all those things quite broadly, and then physiology took my fancy because I kind of liked to understand how the body works. Mm-hmm. So that kind of pursued my passion into physiology. So I went to do a master's at Loughborough University. And then while I was my master's at Loughborough University, I did a few work placements with the likes of British Swimming. Loughborough University have their own sports science department, which I worked in for about six months. And then during that time, the IS advertised a position for sleep. So sleep is one of those areas where it doesn't really fall within a discipline. It kind mm. of sits outside the realms of your traditional sports sciences so everyone was at the moment trying to grab a piece of it so you've kind of got it kind of can sit anywhere really because you can't say it's a physiology thing it you can't really 
do sleep with physiology without understanding the psychology of sleep, for example. And obviously, there's lots of things in nutrition which can impact sleep as well. So you kind of have to have quite a holistic view towards sleep. Mm -hmm. So when that came up, I kind of jumped at the opportunity, really, because like you said, it's quite a niche area, which not many people, particularly in the UK, have really kind of delved into in any detail whatsoever. The opportunity to kind of potentially become one of those people was just, yeah, it was a really good opportunity for me. And I took that. And then I'm four years down the line now, um, currently writing up my PhD, hoping to hand in in probably about four to six months' time. Oh, um, very exciting. So hopefully, yeah, that will be all done and dusted. And then we'd have to see what happens with sleep in England, to see where it goes in terms of research, um, the application of it with elite athletes. It's, it's still it's really just we're starting to get the ball rolling a little bit. So through my PhD, we've unearthed lots of different things. I haven't had the time really to go in and research because it's not really part of my PhD, but I can imagine this area is going to get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of reaffirmed that this is the area you want to go in as you've learned more about it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I've still got a like an underlying passion for like uh, just generic physiology, uh, particularly in team sports, which was kind of my growing interest um, because I'm a a field hockey player by trade, but I do a lot of running in the summer. So I'm kind of a seasonal runner, I suppose. Don't really (laughs) run in the cold. But yeah, so that's still kind of a passion of mine. But um, yes, sleep is something that I've kind of, as I've developed over the years, it's be- I've become more and more interested. Now I can't really see a career without it, to be honest. So mm-hmm. I think it's always going to be part of whatever I do. And I still want to kind of keep the research side of what I'm doing going because, like I said, I've only just really got started. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to go into your research and what you have found in a minute. But firstly, just maybe if you could give us kind of a glimpse into what life is like with your job and maybe some of your favorite parts of it when it comes to working with elite athletes when it comes to sleep and performance yeah sure so um my role is split in two areas really one at Loughborough University is where where, when I'm there I'm kind of a PhD student so I'm kind of heading the books um (laughs) writing reading meeting with different people trying to get my PhD done but the other part of my job I'm working at the English Institute of Sport at Bisham Abbey so here we've got Great Britain rowing, hockey, canoeing, and I think those are the major ones that are based here. Oh no, I'm now recently um, the women's rugby team um, based themselves here. So we've got those sports based here. So my job is really to provide physiological support, mm-hmm. um, not to every sport, but some sports may want a project in. So for example, recently I've done a project with one of those sports looking at adapting to the heat before they go and compete somewhere so we've been doing a lot of heat work in a uh, a heat chamber which you've got here which can go up to 40 degrees Mm. um, celsius so i've been doing that this afternoon actually so so that's like how it affects how the heat affects their sleep um not necessarily sleep this is more just for generic performance okay um so that's although yeah my main role is sleep i I still kind of delve into little parts of physiology so that's kind of one part of my role the other part of my role as you just said there is mainly sleep so in the lead up to the Rio Olympics I worked with I think it was over 33 sports in the end um, basically going into different sports and kind of just looking at what sleep looks like in those sports and trying to make not any drastic changes because that's probably the worst thing you can do before the biggest competition in your life Um, it's kind of making subtle changes to make people feel more comfortable with their sleep so when they get to Rio they felt like they were in control and everything they could do with their sleep was kind of already been done. Mm -hmm. So they could worry about other things when they got there. So that was probably my main role in the lead up to the Olympics. Okay. So then what kind of things, just give us some examples of things that you did work with on people for this. Like how did you get them to feel more comfortable and like their sleep was taken care of, like you said? It's mainly education, really. So people in general, athletes or non-athletes, have quite a what we call a literacy of sleep. So that basic understanding of sleep is quite low. Sleep is one of those things that it's not the information about what it is, what it does, how it works, isn't readily available to the general public. So if you ask anyone about sleep, they don't really know the intricate details. But generally, people know their sleep because they've been doing it since the day they were born. They know the feeling of sleep. They know what a good night's sleep feels like, what a bad night feels like. And within squads, you get people that pin like performance on it to a different extent. So you get some people that fundamentally believe that sleep is crucial for their performance. So if they don't sleep well, 
they fundamentally believe they could perform badly, whereas you have others who believe that it doesn't really matter, so they can sleep really badly and then still perform quite well, or at least feel like they perform quite well. So my main role was to go into squads and upskill them or educate them on the basic science of sleep, also kind of dispel a few myths around what people believe about sleep and also really kind of just give them details on how sleep can affect performance, what it is, what it isn't, and essentially kind of dispelling any anxiety that people have about sleep. So athletes have the opportunity to ask questions about what was worrying about their sleep, what do they think it does to their performance, and I was able to kind of provide really generic messages that are taken from a branch of sleep science that's been around for probably 50, 60 years now. It's not it's not necessarily a new science within, um, in the world of sleep medicine, but within sports science, it is new. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the type of messages we were bringing in was kind of just stuff that's been around for quite a while now, but it's just kind of translating that and applying it to athletes um, whose context of how they perform and do stuff is slightly different to the general public. Oh, okay. And then did you see a difference between across the sports, like different, you said about the different approaches that people have individually, but did you see differences within the sports? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. So sports, within sport, like some of my research recently found that um, there's big differences between sports and how they sleep and how they perceive sleep. So if you look at sport type broadly, you've got your endurance sports, like your runners, your rowers, your triathletes and swimmers. So how those guys sleep is completely different to say how an aesthetic athlete, like a gymnast, a synchronized swimmer, how they sleep is different. Mm -hmm. So if you look at runners and triathletes, for example, typically at the elite level, they're getting up very early to train, purely to fit in the volume of training which they have to fit in, they have to get up early. So because of that, they almost shorten their sleep by just adhering to schedules. Mm -hmm. So from that, they're carrying over like a bit of a sleep drive throughout the day. So they're naturally quite sleepy people. So you'll find that endurance athletes nap a lot in the daytime and they don't take very long to fall asleep and they usually report very good sleep quality. Whereas if you, if you ask another athlete like a, um, let's say a shooter or an archer who don't tend to have the schedules that say endurance sports have plus the amount of, let's say, energy they expend when they yeah. train is great. They're the ones who tend to have sleep problems. Um, they're the guys who don't seem to sleep that well. Um, obviously, you can be an older athlete quite easily and still compete in that sport to quite a high level. Whereas, let's say in rowing or a, a cycling or a um, triathlon, obviously those types of sports have lifespans because it's such a grueling, brutal attack on your body mm-hmm. that essentially you're going to uh, retire at a certain age. So there are, there are fundamental differences based on how sports are exposed to different stresses in the elite sport environment. So training schedules is one, long haul travel is another, stress before competitions another. So there's a whole host of things, I suppose, in the elite sport environment which athletes get exposed to to different extents, which can make them at risk of having poor sleep. But also there's the fundamental traits, like your personality traits, your genetic traits, which you're kind of born with or developed through adolescence, which almost pre-select you for sports so let's say let's go back to the endurance example of runners and swimmers again swimmers fundamentally get up very early in the morning to train yeah if you were one of these people that like to lie in in the morning and go to bed really late at night you're not going to survive in a swimming program because you're going to have to be let's say let's call it a morning type person yeah you're going to have to like performing in the morning because otherwise you're able to keep up with the, the program so that's kind of one side of it as well you kind of get your personality and genetic traits almost predispose you Mm. to participating in a certain sport. That's where it gets interesting. So those traits which predispose you to be, let's say, a swimmer or an elite athlete in general, they may also predispose you to have sleep problems. So we know that elite athletes are quite perfectionists in terms of they want to be the best they can be. Um, They tend to be quite anxious, some of them quite anxious people because they want to be the best, and sometimes that's not always the case. Things, some things don't quite right. So you kind of get these like, profile of personality traits that also might predispose them to sleep problems. So my research has kind of delved into that in some way to try to understand that a bit better. So are elite athletes almost predisposed to sleep problems just by being an elite athlete, or is it there a certain group of athletes within that population that's, uh, let's say, more predisposed because of 
the elite sport environment in which they train in. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely see this. And I, I could imagine like a lot a lot of what you're talking about, especially with, like you said, the endurance athletes and the personality traits. Um, even, you know, a lot of our listeners, I'd say most of our listeners are not elite athletes. And I don't want you guys to think that, oh, well, this doesn't apply to me. Anything, you know, Luke and I talk about today, this doesn't apply. But I'm sure a lot of you guys know that the traits he's describing, the get up early in the morning, the perfectionist, the want to be the best you can be, you still probably have a lot of those in there. And yeah, maybe, okay, you haven't reached the the world level, but I'm sure, um, Luke, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of these probably will be able to be applied to, like you said, the sport in general, not just the top level athletes here. Before we go on. Yeah, that's probably one thing I should have mentioned is the challenges that athletes face, although they're, they're fairly unique to that population, but the underpinning mechanisms that disturb your sleep are no different to the general population or recreational athletes. You could argue that the challenges that the recreational athlete faces might be even greater than the elite athlete in some cases because they've got to fit in work. Obviously, there's family lives, which obviously digs into both um, populations. Mm-hmm. So yeah, essentially, so my early research has kind of suggested that although the elite athletes have like these stressors, you could call them, that challenge their sleep. Students, university students, are no different in the sense that they have to get up early for lectures. They have stresses like exams. Yeah. Uh, recreational athletes, the same way if you're about to run, run the London Marathon, for example, for the first time, you're going to be anxious the night before. And that's no different to an elite athlete being anxious before, let's say, an important competition. Mm-hmm. The mechanisms that disturb their sleep exactly the same so what I, while I'm talking about elite athletes that's that's basically my what my world and what I relate to but essentially this kind of goes down from elite athletes to recreation like even to non-athletes the the things that disturb sleep are general amongst uh, the modern day human being mm-hmm. uh, not just necessarily athletes in general yeah okay so I want to go into your research in a minute but as you just were kind of talking about that you said about some of the myths that um, you hear of over and over again about sleep. So maybe if you could just go over a few of those and kind of what the reality of them is, the ones that you hear quite often. Yeah, of course. Um, so the biggest one, I suppose, is around sleep duration. So we all, we all hear about the magic number of eight hours mm-hmm. that everyone thinks they need to get. And if they don't hit that number of eight hours, then they've had less sleep than they need. So where eight hours has come from is an average of seven to nine hours, which is which is what the average or the range, I suppose, for human beings in general. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean that you sit within that range. There are anomalies. So you get people that could get by on six hours, sometimes even five hours. Um, you hear reports in the media of people sleeping for four hours. But on the other spectrum, you have other people that may need 10 hours sleep or even 11 hours sleep. It's highly individual. So sleep duration isn't a number which you need to hit that is generic for everyone. Everyone will have their own amount of sleep which they need to hit. And it doesn't have to be taken in like one night phase. It's what we call in sleep medicine is total sleep time. So it's the amount of sleep you get over a 24 hour period. So you could, for example, nap for half an hour in the daytime and have seven hours at night. That means your total sleep would be seven and a half hours. So it doesn't have to be all taken in one phase. So that's kind of a generic myth that you have to have eight hours sleep to kind of function and like be healthy on a day-to-day basis. So can I just ask you quickly before you go on? So when you said about it's highly individualized. So if someone listening right now is like, okay, well, how do I know what mine is? Because you hear of people saying, oh, I'm tired today because I overslept or I slept too much (laughs) or I feel fine at six hours, but you know, maybe it's impacting them. How can people kind of know where they fall? Is there a way of like, just, I feel like I had a good sleep or you sleep that amount, a certain number of days in a row. What would you suggest? Yeah, it's it's a tricky one, really. So there's no, even like all the technology we have out there, there's no like one thing you can pin, like Mm -hmm. something you can measure that says like, that was amount amount of sleep I needed. Yeah. Um, So it kind of goes back to the, I suppose the mantra which we kind of chant in sports science is, um, which we have is to listen to your body. So yeah. in the evening, if you feel sleepy, we, we do it all the time. People kind of feel sleepy, then they kind of ignore those feelings of sleepiness and kind of do something else because they want to stay up later, which is which is fine in most cases. <laughs> stay up late all the time. Um, it'd be quite boring if you just kind of went to bed early and when you felt sleepy the whole time. But generally, the rule of thumb is 
if you go to bed when you feel sleepy and you sleep until you feel refreshed, that's generally a, a good sign that you've slept enough. But again, like you said, it's, it gets complicated because if you say had a bad night's sleep one night, the next night's sleep, you're probably given the opportunity, you probably sleep a bit longer. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to kind of explore it a little bit. Like you said, people can sleep for too long. These general feelings of lethargy, if you spend a long time in bed, makes absolute sense. If you lay down for a long period of time, you're going to get up feeling quite groggy. So it's, it's kind of a mixture of sticking to routine. So once you kind of know generally how you feel when you know you've, you've had enough sleep. So let's say, for example, it's seven and a half hours for someone. And also you've got your schedules to fit into that as well. So, for example, if you're a shift worker, obviously that doesn't apply to everyone where you can take your sleep in one hit. You might have to take in a couple of hits or you might have to sleep at different times of day. So although your sleep need may be a certain number, it may be restricted by the demands of society. Mm-hmm. So it kind of still goes back to knowing your body and kind of listening to it. So like you said, people, people know when they slept for too long. Likewise, they know when they haven't slept enough. Um, and because we do this every night, you kind of get an experience of this. So people don't really, they kind of take sleep for granted sometimes where you kind of, you just sleep and you wake up and you go to work, you train, you go back to sleep and, no, and you don't really kind of pay attention to what's really going on, how you feel your sleep, etc. So my advice would be probably to pay attention to your body, how you feel, not just when you wake up in the morning, but around your bedtime as well. So usually because we're kind of creatures of habit, we're unbelievably good as human beings of anticipating when stuff happens. So if you go to bed at the same time every night, you will feel sleepy at that time every night because your body's kind of almost entrained to that. Mm-hmm. And if you find out at the weekend, for example, which is a good place to experiment, that when you give yourself a chance to sleep for longer, if you end up sleeping, say, two to three hours longer than you probably did in the week, the likelihood is in the week you're not getting enough sleep. Whereas if you kind of slept in at weekends and you find you only slept in for an extra, say, half an hour, maybe an hour tops, then you're probably doing it about right. So two things really there. So you've only got to listen to your body in terms of feeling the sleepiness and how you feel in the morning. But also kind of when you've got opportunity for sleep for longer, try to notice differences. And sometimes it's, it's difficult to do because the way our schedules are and train into us through training patterns, through work, through family life. Sleep in a week naturally gets restricted. Mm -hmm. People sleep longer at weekends, but the extent to which people sleep longer will depend on how much sleep you kind of get in the week. Okay. So then what about if you have an early flight, you have to get up at 4am and uh, you didn't sleep well the night before because you were thinking about getting up. Is it better to try and catch up? Like you said, like maybe the next few days add a bit extra. Should someone nap if they could or just kind of get on with the day and go back to bed at that normal habit time? Yeah, it's, that's, it's a very good question, actually. Um, so that's kind of another, not myth, I suppose, but it's kind of a habit that people feel they kind of need to adhere to is uh, when you have lost sleep and you kind of accumulate what we call like a sleep debt, I suppose. Mm-hmm. You have to repay that debt. So let's say you've slept two hours less than normal. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to repay that two hours back the next night. Okay. Sleep doesn't really work like that. It's, it's, quite, it's quite an automated process in the sense that if you've had a bad night's sleep one night, the next night's sleep will more likely than not be better given the opportunity. That's just how sleep works. Mm-hmm. You don't really need to do much. It's when you start interfering with sleep is when things go wrong. So the less you do with sleep, the better it works. So if you yeah, if you had like a, a bad night's sleep because of an early morning flight, for example, my advice would be just to crack on as normal and, and kind of just continue the, your normal routine. Maybe allow yourself like, if it was like a big, big loss of sleep, then obviously lying in for a little bit is going to do you some good. And if you can nap in the daytime, a short nap, again, will obviously add to that sleep time. So some people can tolerate sleep deprivation very well. So sleep deprivation is basically just a loss of sleep. Um, some people can lose a lot of sleep and function very well throughout the day other people can lose sleep and they feel like they've been hit by a bus um it it feels awful um, and they really can't cope with it so there's very big differences in terms of how people cope with it but generally adhering to your routines you'll be fine Um, it kind of adjusts on it by itself
Okay, great. And uh, so once again, we are learning, uh, listen to your body and don't compare yourself. We hear this over and over again in running. So there's just another lesson with this. And any other myths that you hear often that you would like to mention before we go? On? Yeah, so um, a lot of them, um, particularly going back to the sleep duration one is, you could go on for other hours actually. Um, but I suppose the other one is going to bed early is not necessarily means your sleep's going to be better. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people think that if you go to bed early, it's, it's quite ingrained in our society that you, particularly with kids, for example, you tell kids to go to bed early or like, I'm going to bed early tonight because I've got an early start the next day, etc. People tend to believe that if you go to bed early, you're going to sleep better. And that, mm-hmm. that's not the case. Sometimes it can actually cause sleep problems. So if you go back to the, the routine thing where we're saying stick to your routines, going to bed earlier. So athletes do this all the time before competition yeah. because they, they feel like they need to sleep well before, let's say, an important run the next day or like a marathon or a race, whatever. Um, so they go to bed early to try and get more sleep than normal because they believe it could have some kind of effect on their performance the next day. But what tends to happen is they end up lying there for longer than normal mm-hmm. and because they're not falling asleep, they get stressed. And because they get stressed, they can't fall asleep. And it's a vicious cycle that goes round and round. And before you know it, you've been lying in bed for quite a long time worrying about not getting enough sleep yeah. by the action which you thought was meant to cause you to get better sleep. So you kind of, <laughs> you kind of put yourself in a bit of a hole. So again, it goes back to the, root, the thing of like, if, for example, before competition or like before anything, really, if you want to get up early, you might as well stick to a normal routine, okay. um, take, take the hit a little okay. bit. You can tolerate a bit of sleep deprivation pretty well. And like I said before, you can carry that over to the next night and you'll probably have a much better night's sleep the next night. Trying to kind of manipulate sleep schedules, what we call that, like when you go to bed, when you wake up. Messing around with it a bit too much can kind of cause more problems than it causes good. All right, then um, I want to ask you a little more about your research in particular, because I'm sure people are going to be interested and, uh, you know, everyone seems to love the science here. So maybe go over, you know, your research on the role of sleep for performance and what you found, you know, how motivation chains, uh, effort changes and, you know, physiological changes that you've noticed. Yeah, sure. Um, so my, my PhD is looking at trying to identify athletes that are more prone to sleep disturbances um, than, than others. That's kind of what I said a bit earlier. Um, so my PhD hasn't really looked at how sleep impacts performance, mm-hmm. um, but I've, I've obviously read quite a lot around the area. And it's, it's one of those areas which I don't think there's a clear cut relationship between sleep and performance. Um, there's a lot of research out there which uh, has been done in laboratories, for example, where they've done complete sleep deprivation. So they basically take away sleep entirely for one night, maybe two nights, and they look at the impact on performance. Mm-hmm. So believe it or not, not sleeping for two days puts you in a pretty pretty bad place and you don't perform <laughs> well in any task. But the research where you kind of disturb sleep slightly in a real world scenario, one is quite difficult to do, particularly with, say, athletes before important events and two it's yeah disturbing someone's sleep in different ways so how your sleep's disturbed but it would be very different to how my sleep is disturbed let's mm-hmm. say you could wake up a lot in the night whereas I could have problems falling asleep so it's not so clear cut in the sense that how sleep is disturbed and the impact on performance it's, it's, it's very complicated um, so you, you can't just say if you've had a bad night's sleep you're going to perform badly in fact, I know a lot of athletes that I work with who are probably the poorest sleepers, and they're actually the best performers. And the reason for that is, is something that is part of my big part of my research is this theory of hyperarousal. So hyperarousal is, I suppose, in layman's terms, those people who are just bouncing off the walls all the time. They're just um, wired. And they they can't shut down in the evening and all, all day. They're kind of you're the person who's chatty all the time. They're always kind of the life of the soul of the party, et cetera. They're those types of people. So those type of people, they're very good at performing in the day because that's just how they're wired. So they can get their arousal system, which is a part of your brain that causes us to be awake. They can get that firing on all cylinders and more in the daytime, which allows them to basically perform at their best. If you look at um, team sports, a big example of that, where that's very advantageous goalkeepers american football baseball even in long distance running um, that can be beneficial if you can sustain attention for long periods of time because you've got this like wired arousal system mm-hmm. um, 
would be great. So that's that's good for short term performance, but it's very difficult for people to shut down because they're just constantly going. So my research is basically try to identify those people through a battery of tests. And you don't really need a battery of tests. You know who these people are. They're kind of the ones who, they're just, like I said, bouncing off the walls all the time. But also, you also get um, certain traits of their personalities, the certain way they sleep. There's some certain aspects which kind of make them, you can you notice these people um, through for more scientific, rigorous assessment, which I've done. So I come up with a battery of tests which identifies these people. And I'm basically trying now to kind of put these interventions in place, which takes away some of this pre-sleep arousal, we call it. So you're um, basically like anything that basically keeps you up at night, I suppose. So it could be anything you're thinking about. Um, mm-hmm. It could be heart, your heart's racing because you've trained late. Um, your muscles feel tense. Um, all these things are sources of arousal. They just, they just manifest themselves differently. So we've all had the experience of you can't shut your head off because you're just thinking of stuff over and over again. Everyone goes through that. So this, this happens more often than not in these like wired people. So the stuff that I'm trying to do is make sleep education and sleep management more specific to the individual who are basically wired. So those are people that get their sleep disturbances the most. What can we do to help them basically de-arouse themselves before bed? And what are some of the things you've, you've found help? Um, there's, there's lots of things, really. There's, there's, one major one, which is very simple, and it seems a bit counterintuitive, but it's basically going to bed later. So the way to kind of make yourself feel sleepy is stay up late. So the way sleep works is the longer you stay awake, the sleepier you feel. That's one of the rules of sleep. And the other rule of sleep is what we call a circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. So every biological system behavior in our body will have a certain pattern over 24 hours. So for example, let's say um, hunger. Most people are hungry in the morning, then they get hungry in the afternoon, and they get hungry again in the evening. So you have these peaks and troughs throughout the day. And it's the same with body temperature. Your body te- temperature goes up, it goes down all throughout the day. And sleep's exactly the same. We sleep at night and we stay awake in the daytime. So these two things kind of intertwine, form basically what we fundamentally call sleep science. So to manipulate the, the rule that the longer you stay awake, the sleepier you feel, for someone who's got arousal on or like thinking about stuff they can't switch their head off they heart rate's going they they can't wind down staying awake for an extra hour or two will basically one give you more time to relax and let that arousal dissipate so i'm not gonna provide examples of how to relax because that's so highly individual so a lot, a lot of people like to read a lot of people like to watch tv a lot of people like to do their own thing to relax so that's very high individual but essentially it's delaying sleep times so making yourself go to bed later Mm -hmm. also ensuring you have a period of let's say 30 minutes at least where you're doing something that is relaxing prior to trying to sleep so the biggest thing what happens with people particularly when they compete or train late at night is they get home from training Um, this applies to elite athletes and regular athletes and people who work late as well and because it's gone past their normal bedtime they basically try and quickly as possible try and go to bed yeah. because they feel like they're not going to get enough sleep. So like I said, it seems quite counterintuitive, but actually having some wind down time or delaying sleep by say an hour or so ends up going to bed later, but the quality of sleep, because you haven't gone to bed in a stressed state, this is so much better. Yeah. So you might, you might, have, you might sacrifice an hour, half an hour of sleep, but because you're not stressed, you're probably not waking up enough uh, at much at night and you basically feel more rested when you wake up because the quality of sleep is not much better. So that's kind of that's probably one of the simple interve- interventions of which we kind of use with athletes. Again, it's not rocket science in a way. Again, it's just again, like I said at the start, understanding how sleep works and the science of sleep. So if you go remember those two rules of the longer you stay awake, the sleeper you feel, and well, everyone knows if we go to sleep at night and we stay awake in the daytime, you can kind of manipulate manipulate sleep quite cleverly to help yourself particularly when you get stressed okay yeah no that that makes a lot of sense and actually very interesting um I have spoken on the show before about I've actually been to a sleep therapist I am unfortunately one of those wired people you talked about and um I I can definitely attest to the staying up later that was one of the tricks we used was the sleep restriction where I wasn't allowed to go to bed before midnight 
and you know I was trying to keep my eyes open by the end but had to had to do it and get up at five and restrict it for a few days and then slowly push my bedtime back and so I definitely found that helps and also was kind of like a reset as well each time I did that so I would say if you are struggling with sleep to try that it definitely would help and I think we've all done that where we've tried to force ourselves to go to bed when we aren't ready and and what would you say so if someone did try to go to bed and their mind is buzzing or the is it is it better to just get up and you know go out of the room and relax for a bit and do you know read a book or watch tv or whatever like you said or is it better to just keep trying to sleep even though you know obviously you're getting yourself more and more worked up thinking you know can i when when am i going to fall asleep yes you've, you've nailed it on the head there so yeah you said something very interesting there which is something called make an effort to sleep so like I said before, when you try to do anything with sleep, that's when it tends to go wrong. So there's something in sleep medicine called the attention, intention, effort pathway, um, which is something where basically it means that when you try to sleep and it doesn't quite work, you start to attend to negative thoughts around the consequences of not being able to sleep. and yeah. which Counting itself, down how many hours you have left. <laughs> <laughs> And that in itself causes more cognitive arousal, which prolongs your ability to fall asleep even longer. So you kind of break in the cycle is quite a simple thing to do. So if, if you can't get to sleep within, say, 15, 20 minutes, or if you notice that you're, you're lying down, you know you're not going to go to sleep because your head's buzzing or your heart's racing, whatever, you feel just uncomfortable. You just don't feel quite right because of um, something might have happened before. You might have an argument with your partner. You might have something might have happened that's caused you to be stressed. Um, yeah, getting out of bed and doing something relaxing, even sitting up in bed, changing your position if you can't get out of bed. If you can just sit up in bed, and do something different and relax, read, do some, watch TV until you feel sleepy again. And when you notice those feelings of sleepiness kick in, again, don't like rush to bed as quickly as possible to try and sleep. Obviously, that will kind of wake you up again. But just kind of gradually go back to sleep again and then before you know it you'll be falling asleep and if you do that if you're one of those people that kind of this happens to a lot if you do that repeatedly over time you kind of create this like behavioral association with only keeping your bed for sleep mm -hmm. so a, a big mistake that people make that who can't sleep very well is that they do a lot of waking activities in bed so they may eat their dinner in bed. They may watch TV in bed. Everyone does watch TV in bed. It's not necessarily the baddest thing in the world. But um, if you've got a sleep problem, then sometimes keeping your bed for sleep only can be a big help. Because it almost like tells your body when you get into bed, it's time to sleep. Whereas if you're doing other things that you normally do when you're awake in bed, your body doesn't really know what when it's time to sleep, when it's not to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, that's light, light exposure is massive when it comes to sleep. Um, yeah. so our whole physiology is dictated by the sun. And when it sets and when it gets dark. Um, so if you can make it dark, so when you relax, if you can't fall asleep, if you do it in dim lighting, um, it's going to help things better. If you do you a bright light shining in your face, then obviously your body's going to think that the sun's up or something and it, you're not going to fall asleep as readily. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then, so then let's talk about some other sleep aids. As you mentioned, the light. I will say I do use those uh, melatonin or light blocking goggles, the orange glasses, and I will recommend those. I will put a link in the show notes to those. And also what I have found has helped me if, if this is something you've struggled with and, you know, uh, as I have focused a lot on this, but give us some advice uh, as you are the expert with, you know, what other things work? Like let's maybe go into melatonin. Is taking that good or taking like sleep aids? Is there any issues with, with those for repeated use? Yeah, so the the whole sleep aid, I think I think that, I think there's a time and a place for it. For example, sleep medication is probably the the most, I suppose, clinical. I suppose sleep aid, and there there is a time and place for it, and they are safe. They do what they say on the tin, and melatonin the same. It's it does what it says on the tin, and it is safe. But I suppose when when the problems come in with any external aid, mm -hmm. uh, when to sleep is that. If you use it repeatedly, you almost create some kind of dependency. So yeah. let's say you have, you have a gizmo. I've seen these like pebbles you can put under your pillow apparently, and it makes you sleep better. Let's say you use one of those, and you notice that you do sleep well because of it. It might be not because it's 
that per se, but just having it there makes you sleep better. Let's just say, for example, mm-hmm. um, over time you keep using it and using it, and then let's say, let's say you lose it for whatever reason, and all of a sudden your sleep goes to pot because that thing is not there anymore. So that, that's the same with anything when it comes to like long-term kind of dependency on sleep aids, where, whether it's medication, melatonin, whether it's doing something else which requires an external something to help you sleep. That, that's when it gets a problem. And some of the, the techniques and stuff that we try to use here at Loughborough University in the IS is it's almost like, inter, I suppose like internal techniques. So stuff you can do in your head, which you can take anywhere in the world of you. Um, you're not relying on something external, which basically makes you feel better to fall asleep. You basically you're in control. So when when you feel like you're out of control or something else is controlling your sleep, that's when it can go wrong. So when you're when you're taking say melatonin sleep medication repeatedly, you're ne- you're not necessarily in control of your sleep. You fundamentally believe that it's that thing that is making you sleep. Okay. So. So that's when it, sometimes it can be a bad thing. But for example, let's say you're on a long haul flight and you're on there for 24 hours and you can't sleep on a plane and you want to sleep. Taking a sleep sleeping pill then is a very sensible thing to do because no one can really sleep on a plane because it's cramped, uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You've got people in your personal space everywhere. So that that's a perfectly acceptable place to do it, I think. And it, it can it can work if you're going for a really bad patch of sleep, let's say for um, months, for example, when you really need to break the cycle, then that's when it's used in that way. I think it, that, that has a place for it. But yeah, I would say like external aids like melatonin and um, uh, sleep medication are probably like a last port of call. There's a whole host of things you can try, which is very behavioral and cognitive. By cognitive, I mean stuff you can do in your head, really, that basically can help you get into a really relaxed state and help you sleep because essentially that's what you need to do um, mm-hmm. when you sleep is do nothing yeah uh, so if you can like not think about falling asleep and not really think about the consequences of sleep the next day that's when sleep happens so if you ask someone who doesn't sleep very well why don't you sleep well they'll give you every reason under the sun why they don't sleep well if you ask a good sleeper why do you sleep so well they're, they probably won't be able to tell you because it just happens for them yeah because they didn't really do anything so when it comes to sleep aids, I think the more you can have control of it, the better. For example, one of a very good thing to do, um, which is readily available, um, I think you can download apps for these things now, is something called progressive muscle relaxation. Okay. So it's a series of exercise where you go through each muscle in your body, from your hands to your lower forearms to your arms, and you basically hold, you tense them as hard as you can for say five to ten, let's say five seconds. And then you basically let go and you notice the sensation, the relaxation of your muscles. Mm-hmm. You basically go through this process through every muscle in your body. And then when you get good at it, you can do this in bed. And what you tend to find is that your whole body just feels completely relaxed and your muscle tension is completely gone. And because you're focusing on tensing muscles and not really thinking about anything else, before you know it, you feel like you're six inches deeper into your mattress and you've fallen asleep. So that's an example of something that I would say you could argue as a sleeping aid. Yeah. But it's something that you're in control of. It's not something that you're putting into your body or something that you need to be there for you to be asleep. It's something that you're doing. You're in control of it. And that's why that technique is particularly effective. Okay. Any other ones that you would suggest you said about behavior? There's some um, like things you can do in your head. So like counting sheep, for example. Right, so that <laughs> does work? It's an old wife's tale, but um, yes, it does work. It doesn't have to be counting sheep. So anything that you can, like a certain breathing exercise, you're breathing, like noticing the air go through your nose or even through one nostril and out the other nostril, which sounds ridiculous, but um, and obviously it's impossible. But if you, if you really visualize that happening, mm. you're kind of taking your mind away from other things that's worrying you or the thought process of sleep. And before you know it, because you've got bored of doing this activity, <laughs> you've fallen asleep. So the, again, these, these are, they're not necessarily distraction techniques. They're kind of, I suppose it's a type of mindfulness in a way where you, you've taken your mind to a, a place which is, isn't kind of worrying about other stuff, which kind of has got you to a bad place in the, in the first place. It's kind of allowing you to relax in your own way. And these techniques don't work for everyone. And this is just, I'm just reeling off things at the top of my head here. No, so no, it's next, helpful. So reading, reading is a perfect one. Reading is lots. If, if people like reading, reading before bed is brilliant because it's as long as it's like a horror book or a action thriller where you're kind of getting yourself worked up. But 
stuff like that is can be really effective. So I would much encourage looking into those like techniques as opposed to investing money in kind of sleeping aids. Okay. Um, they, they 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 do they can work for some again um, melatonin ones where it can get quite complicated because you have to look at the dosage when you take it and that's a lot of effort. Whereas if you can just breathe through your nose a few times and fall asleep, it seems a lot easier. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's different things you can try before no, you. No, that's have great. To- Although I have one question for you. So sometimes when I'm falling asleep, and you said about falling like sit, feeling like you're six inches more into your mattress, I find myself thinking any minute now I'll be asleep because I can tell I'm relaxed but I think any yeah. minute now I'll fall asleep and then of course what happens when you think that but then yeah. you start being like okay well it's all right I'll be asleep in five minutes oh, well I'm not asleep yet oh and then and then it starts you know building back up again so what how do you yeah. stop yourself if you get in that thought this is a bit of a selfish question but I'm sure I'm not the only one uh, thinking this well I suppose that's, that's the I suppose that's that's a te- type of sleep effort in a way, isn't it? Yes, yeah. You're kind of saying, right, okay, right, it's about to happen. I can't wait for this to happen. And you're getting a bit <laughs> excited about it. So I think, like, if, if you do if you do start to do that and it doesn't quite happen, having some sort of, like, mind trick, or it's not a mind trick, I suppose doing it a disservice. It's kind of a, if you could develop some kind of technique where you can take your thoughts away from that thinking. Okay. Then I think that would definitely help and it, it, you might have to play with it a little bit in terms of what it is if you might be counting backwards from 100 or something like that mm-hmm. there's different things you can try but some for some people that in itself is too cognitively arousing because you're thinking yeah. of just too hard so again it's highly individual what works yeah. doesn't I suppose, I suppose it goes back to if you take it back another step understanding the consequences of you not falling asleep at that moment in mm-hmm. time what is the actual consequence going to be in reality, probably not a lot. You're probably going to get up if you don't fall asleep, walk around for 15 minutes, sit down, do something more for you lose half an hour of sleep. But like I said before, because sleep is an automated process, what happens is you carry that sleepiness through to the next night and you have a much better night's sleep anyway. Mm-hmm. So you can always take confidence from the fact that if you don't quite fall asleep readily as you want to or you don't have quite a good night's sleep generally, you have the confidence in the fact that the way sleep works the next night within the next night after that you'll probably have a better night's sleep mm-hmm. so it doesn't really matter that much if oh you don't. yeah yep actually yeah and that's uh, sim- very similar to what my uh, sleep therapist said so interesting yeah. to hear the same thing and then just before we we go on I just have a few more little questions about it based on your um, research what did you find on sleep and performance like just how important is this to performing well I mean you mentioned the people who are like wired and they tend to be the best performers but is it completely individualized like you mentioned or is sleep like critical for everyone for performance I think it's it can it can indirectly have an impact on performance but I suppose the biggest impact it kind of is on well-being so People always, like, I suppose, they underestimate the effect of sleep on well-being. So, for example, you could have um, a poor diet or you don't exercise very much. And I suppose that will take months, even years to manifest itself as a poor life choice or something that has an impact on your health. Whereas sleep, if you have a bad night's sleep or two nights sleep, you know immediately that you haven't slept well. You're, you're moody, um, mm-hmm. your mood changes, perception of effort goes up during training we all know that so your kind of your physical performance doesn't change that much but your well-being does so let's say that happens repeatedly what happens is your ability to adhere to that training on a day-to-day basis becomes much less because we know that if you don't sleep very well for example it's that much more of an effort to get out of bed to go and train in the morning so if you haven't slept very well the last thing you want to do is get out of bed and go for a run if you've slept really well you probably jump out of bed immediately and go for a run so we know it can almost like change that side of things. And we know that it can increase your susceptibility to illness. Um, so if you don't sleep very well for long periods of time, you're more susceptible to colds, um, et cetera, like that. So obviously that can take you out of training for periods of time. So they, they can have an impact on performance that way. That's more of a, like a training long-term view, but it could also have an impact on your night before performance or the actual performance through anxiety. So not sleeping well can increase anxiety, which may increase anxiety before performance. And if you're a particularly anxious person, if you're over anxious before a race, you might not perform as well. Whereas if you're not an anxious person, then obviously it won't really affect you. So it is highly individual in terms of how it affects performance, but it's not a 
like I said before, it's not like a clear cut. If you don't sleep well, you don't perform well. Okay. And like I said, these people that are, tend to be wired can override these feelings of sleepiness in the daytime. So if you're in a sport where you have to sustain attention for a long period of time, so a marathon run, for example, if you can't sustain attention for a long time because you haven't slept very well, then that may change your pacing strategy. You may make a bad decision. Mm-hmm. Um, you may go off too hard. So that it could affect things that way. But physiologically, it may not have that much of an impact. But like I said before, it's a really complicated area. It's very difficult to connect one to another. So there's no really cause and effect going on here. We don't know really what how it impacts performance. Um, I've seen studies where athletes that finish like in the, at the top of rankings in events sleep the worst, and the ones who finish lower down sleep the best. So there's no there's some there seems to be some exceptions to the rule here where not everyone has to sleep well to perform well. But okay. The matter of the fact is, yes, everyone sleeps. And the better you sleep, I suppose your well-being will be much better for it. So if you have better well-being, you're more motivated to train, your adherence to training sessions are better because you don't take time out because of fatigue, um, illness, motivation. So it can affect performance that way, but not necessarily directly performance. Okay. So if if someone is, you know, getting ready for the night before a race, they aren't one of those like wired people that we've kind of talked about, but they're thinking, okay, you know, you said it's not directly tied to performance other than through anxiety, but what about, you know, if I'm going to spend all night stressing, like, you know, sh- should they just kind of accept and say, okay, it's all right. You know, I'm only going to get six hours sleep um, and just kind of accept it. Or how can they approach it without kind of doing what you talked about earlier of the like going to bed too early thing, if they know they've got to be up at 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. for their marathon? Like, how can they prevent that becoming an anxiety? Yes, it's a very good question. Um, So if I go back to what elite athletes do, um, so night before competition is the most disturbing stressor I suppose mm-hmm. for sleep in the elite, elite sport a, a large majority of athletes have poor sleep before the comp- before a competition if it's important to them and the ones who sleep well before a competition you probably start questioning how they what their relationship to that performance is so it's probably not that important to them if they can sleep really well because they're not really thinking about it so yeah. if you're to race the most important race of your life um, naturally you're not going to sleep well because you're not going to be relaxed because you're going to yeah. be worried so you can take comfort that your sleep might be disturbed but so will every other athlete mm-hmm. in that rest of sleep will be disturbed as well um because that's just how sleep works if you're if you're thinking it doesn't have to be anxiety just thinking about your performance will um can delay sleep mm-hmm. yeah so accept, accepting it's quite a good thing to do and normalizing it so normalizing it to other people normalize it and kind of say to yourself if if, you, if you've slept well, that's another good thing too, which I forgot to mention is kind of sleeping well before a known period of disturbance. So there's some recent research has come out saying that if you, well, they call it sleep banking, which is physiologically impossible. You can't store sleep. But mm-hmm. basically what it's saying is that if you optimize your sleep in a period up to a known night of disturbance, so let's say you know your sleep is going to be bad because of an early morning get up and worry about competition the night before a marathon, for example, if you've had, say, the, the nights before that have been pretty good, you can take comfort in the fact that that one night is probably not going to have much of an impact at all on your sleep. Whereas if you've had like quite a long period of bad sleep leading up to that event, then that's, that's a different story. But so ensuring you give yourself adequate opportunity to sleep leading up to the event is probably the best thing you can do. So, for example, they would say you need to get a good night's sleep before the event. I would argue that it's probably the days leading up to the two, two, even one day before competition that are probably more important because inevitably, because of scheduling, worry, your sleep will be disturbed. Um, it's probably just not, you can't really get away from it, unfortunately, which is, is quite a good message to give out to people because okay. that way they almost expect it to happen. So when it, they don't really, when it does happen, they don't feel like, oh God, I can't fall asleep. If they know it's going to happen, then it kind of that reduces anxiety in itself. Okay. And I could imagine like, you know, if you're traveling somewhere for a race and you have the opportunity, you know, so let's say you get to somewhere either the day before or two days before, you know, you're in a new place that's going to bring up a load of like new stimulation that might keep you up. But if you get good sleep the week of the race before you travel, then, um, you know, you feel confident. And then if you don't sleep in this new place where there's all this new stuff, then 
oh well you know I'll be fine because you know you've kind of banked it up so I think exactly. yeah I think that's that's very good advice there and then just before we get on to the final kick round do you have any future research that you plan on doing that we can kind of keep up to date with yeah so I've recently published like a literature review mm -hmm. uh, which is readily available out there um yep. I'm happy to provide you the link yeah to I'll put you... a link in the show notes for sure and then I suppose yeah because I'm writing up my PhD I've got a few more studies that are probably on the brink of being submitted for publication so and I suppose they're they're more to do with some of the things what we've talked about so between sport differences in sleep quality and I suppose it's the, the latter end of my work is a bit more confidential given my associations with elite athletes mm -hmm. etc but yeah in good time that will be um, I hope anyway <laughs> it will be published so yeah my in terms of how my work's going to go moving forward I suppose I don't really know myself but essentially I'm still interested in sleep um, and it's there's so much I haven't done so a lot of stuff I've spoke to you about tonight it's not necessarily part of my PhD my PhD is more about is identifying vulnerable sleepers all the stuff I spoke to you about has been more about stuff I've read around the topic through okay. my reading so yeah to answer your question a bit more concisely it's it's providing um, I suppose a I suppose a package of education techniques to athletes which they can use um, anywhere in the world to help them sleep better yep. that's kind of what I want to do next year okay great I will put uh, all the links in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc147 and just for anyone listening uh, what would be the best way for people to follow you I will put that lit review up but would you say twitter is your best uh, yes yeah. twitter is the best place okay yeah. and what is your twitter handle just for anyone listening It'll be Luke Gup 86. Gup 86. All right. And I will put a link in the show notes. Okay. We're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and we will be right back for the final kick round. By now, you've probably heard me talk about how a body health perfect amino is the perfect blend of the eight essential amino acids to help you build and repair your muscles, your tissues, and of course, improve recovery. I take it along with their complete plus detox multivitamin and during my recent marathon build up I took perfect amino a few times a day which allowed me to bounce back from my workouts quicker and to keep training hard so I could have a good race in the fall which is kind of important right? Have you used coupon code TINA10 yet? The body health team would love to hear your feedback Yes, another reason I love them. And you can share your experience with Perfect Amino through the show notes for this episode by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. Oh, and you can enter to win a six pack worth $230 there too. So once again, that link is runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. I wish you all the luck. This is the time of year many of us commit to being better and doing what we can to reach our goals. For me, it's doing more stretching and mobility work, and you've heard me admit it here, so hold me to it. But once the busyness of life, the nasty weather, and the tiredness from training accumulates in our legs, that motivation slips away, and it can be really hard to get it back. Now, we could reward ourselves with food, but after all that indulging over the holidays, most of us probably need to work on making better choices. We all know that new running shoes or new running clothes have a bit of a power to get us excited about running again, especially if they look stylish. The Saucony Freedom ISO has become my new favourite shoe, not just because they're nice to look at, but because the Ever Run sole gives back with every step. So even on my most tired day, I feel like I'm getting a little bit of a push from the ground. I absolutely love them and I think you will too. So if you live in the US, make sure you use coupon code TINA to get 10% off your order at Saucony.com. Okay, Luke, just five more little questions for you, starting with the greatest advice you've ever received. So the greatest advice I received was quite recently, actually. It was um, when you have a setback, there's no bad experiences. Mm. Um, and that relates to training, what I do, academia, just life in general. Yeah, I love that. You always, you always learn something from a setback. Yeah. Um, you always look at it positively. That's great. Yeah, definitely. Okay, favourite running book or blog? Um, running book would be Ultra Marathon Man. Okay. Um, I'm a like a trail runner in the okay. summer anyway. Um, I'm, I'm quite I'm quite keen on like adventure running and I've done a few mountain marathons in my time. Well, I've done one actually. So I'm a um, I, I want to do another quite okay. soon. Cool. Um, 
Yep, that's a good choice. Uh, what would you like to tell if you're going to say, if we say a new runner who, you know, is maybe concerned about if they're getting enough sleep? My, I suppose you've probably heard this quite a lot already. Um, I would say listen to your body. Yep. Um, no, it's, that's it's, good it's what it, particularly when it comes to sleep, though, it's slightly different. I suppose when you take it into the context of your training as well, um, it can be really powerful. Your body tends to know what it's talking about. So if you wake up and you don't particularly feel like running, then there's probably a reason for that. Okay. Um, so don't, don't ignore the signals. Mm-hmm. Very true. All right. Uh, what is your pre-race meal when you do run? Um, it's quite specific. It's um, a toasted wholemeal bagel with peanut butter, banana and honey. Good choice. That's actually probably quite a popular choice within our listeners. So, um, yeah, good choice. And finally, uh, favorite running product? Um, that would be my Polar RC3 GPS watch. Okay. Um, it's got me out of quite a few sticky situations where I've got lost. Um, <laughs> That's always helpful. <laughs> okay, Luke, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And we've learned so much today. Um, I look forward to following along in the future. Thank you. Thank you. How interesting was that? I don't know about you, but sleep absolutely fascinates me. And I have to admit, the last time we did the sleep episode, I ended up sleeping worse for a while because I got myself in that mode of I have to get sleep, I have to get sleep. And we know what happens when that happens. We talked about it in this episode. But this time, after I talked to Luke, I felt confident and I've actually been sleeping pretty well. So Hopefully that continues for me and hopefully you guys get some great sleep too. Now, if you're interested in hearing more about what my sleep therapist taught me about sleep, I did mention that in the interview, I'll put a link in the show notes to my personal blog post about it, in addition to what Luke and I talked about today and some of his research studies. So you can find those at the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC147. And I just want to remind you, have you checked out the daily podcast yet? In case you haven't, I haven't been doing a very good job at my community manager job, if that's the case, but (laughs) these are mini episodes for Runners Connect podcast. It's called The Final Kick, so run to the top, final kick. Uh, They're 10 to 15 minutes long, and we answer your questions that you either call in or email in, and it's been live for a few weeks now. This week is actually my week for answering questions. So if you head over to runnersconnect.net forward slash daily, you can find episodes 11 to 15 plus the other 10 episodes so far. And if you have a question that you would like one of the coaches to ask, or even if you would like to ask me, you can specify it there. You can submit your question at that link. And I'll also put a link to the daily podcast in the show notes, which again are at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC147. Next week, we are going to be talking to my sports psychologist, Evie Saventi, and I cannot wait for you to meet her. So I'm not going to say any more, but just tune in, trust me. Thank you so much for listening today. I really appreciate that you've chosen to listen to Run to the Top, and I hope you have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Run to the Top podcast from runnersconnect.net. 